great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. As you can hear, my voice is starting to go for, uh, I got a little bit of a sickness, um, but I'll just sort of get through this the best I can. Also, unfortunately for you, I prepared a PowerPoint presentation, um, which is certainly not quite uh, necessarily interesting or sexy, but I think it will get the, uh, the important message across. And as you can see, I don't even know how to start it. Where does it say start slideshow? Should be at the bottom, right? That's too dark. There we go. OK, so first of all, um, this is a talk, unfortunately, even though it's, uh, it's about Hegel, it's actually going to be about more than just Hegel and probably might have less Hegel than you really want because we're going to have to talk about um, uh, uh, Aristotle a little bit. Um, partly what I'm interested in is um, sort of seeing why Hegel th thinks what he does about evolutionary biology. And exactly what that is, I will, um, I'll tell you in just a second. Um, but as far as uh, just the, the talk goes, the, we don't have to be formal about this. You guys can stop me and ask me questions anytime you'd like to, or we can save them all for the end, whatever. Um, and also, number two, this is just a point. If, if you have no idea what this means, don't worry about it. Um, if you do, uh, this, is, this is for you then. Um, Hegel is usually understood as having this very rigid structure of his philosophy uh, that, that is a, this dialectical structure where a thesis pr is proposed and it uh, generates this antithesis, which generates a new synthesis. And this way of looking at Hegel is uh, uh, appropriate for certain kinds of things. But if you think about things in this way, and if you're listening to me talk about this, trying to figure out where this is, you're not going to find it. So if you're thinking about that, just don't do it. All right? Just uh, banish it from your mind. Um, and if you don't know anything about it, then you're just in a better position than everybody else who does know about it. Right? And there's a picture of Hegel, just so you guys can see who it is I'm talking about. Of course, he looks like a very jolly guy. <laughs> All right. So uh, let me tell you first, uh, just in general, what I, th I think about Hegel and Hegel's uh, sort of philosophy of biology. Um, the thing is, is in Hegel's works, we have this, uh, th this sense that um, both thought as well as history are in this process of development from the past into the future, from the, the simple to the more complex. And everything you see when you read Hegel, it's always one stage comes after the other. right? And so the idea of uh, evolution, just considered very generally, is uh, of fundamental importance. Right? So again, conceptual evolution, historical evolution. But when we get to Hegel's philosophy of nature, his philosophy of biology, or his philosophy of organic life, we find it's, it's not just that Hegel is um, uh, not interested in evolution, but that he seems to be fundamentally against evolutionary biology. Right? Now, what's important in, to, to keep in mind here is if you look at the dates of his major works, right? this is all early 19th century. Right? And so, uh, we can, to a certain degree, understand um, why he might not be as uh, open to evolution as, uh, or evolutionary biology as uh, one might expect, because of course Darwin didn't publish Origin of the Species until 1859. Right? However, as I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later, um, ideas about evolution go back at least as far as Aristotle. There's a particular um, passage in Aristotle's Physics which um, you know, puts that idea out there. And I, th I think the reason that uh, Hegel seems to be against this notion of uh, evolutionary biology comes from him being sort of in bed with Aristotle in a certain way of thinking about the world. Right? So um, this is just a, a kind of a, a background of, uh, of Hegel's major works, right? Uh, uh, the Phenomenology of Spirit, The Science of Logic, and The Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences. Um, I'm going to be talking primarily about uh, uh, what he says in the uh, second volume of the Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences, uh, which is his uh, philosophy, of, uh, philosophy of nature. Right? Um, but this is, again, just to sort of situate um, the, um, uh, the, the view. And also, what I'm going to be talking about uh, are Hegel's debts to the thought of Aristotle as well as of Kant. Because I think if we look at uh, the, what these guys have to say about the way that we conceptualize and understand the world, uh, this will get us to understand why Hegel thinks what he does about, uh, about evolutionary biology. All right. So just, uh, I, I think my, the, the best way to explain what it is I'm going to be doing is I'm going to try to you know, continue to sort of hone in on just what the problem is. Right? Um, you know, a lot of times in philosophy, uh, we you know, 
solve important problems, perhaps, or um, you know, you know, develop interesting theses about the way that the world is. Uh, but half the battle is just figuring out what really is wrong to begin with, and so uh, that's mostly what I'm going to be doing here, trying to explain why this is an issue in Hegel's philosophy and uh, how we get there, and that sort of helps us to find uh, a way out of it, perhaps. So there's really, I think, two uh, key aspects of philosophical thought and Hegel's philosophy in particular that will uh, help to focus our, um, our investigation. Uh, the first is the notion of uh, teleology, right? Um, and a, uh, a distinction between kinds of teleology, internal teleology and external teleology, right? Now the important thing about teleology, is that, as you guys may know, is that this was one of the fundamental guiding principles of natural science up until the, um, the, the Renaissance and modern science with individuals like Galileo and Newton and, and so on, right? Um, coming out of Aristotle, um, Aristotle argues that uh, one way in which we can understand the world is to ask what things are for, right? That is, uh, you, know, you know, why do fish have flippers, right, or fins, right, so, that's, so they can push themselves through the water, right? Uh, but this, this view of teleology is applied to everything, so that even the explanation of gravity is that, you know, why does the apple fall from the tree? Well, then it's because the natural state of the apple on the tree is to have this desire to reach the center of the earth. Right? Now, what modern science showed, modern physics showed, is that it's possible to explain natural phenomena right, without appeal to any sort of uh, teleological factors. Right? The reason that you know, uh, you know, balls roll down inclined planes is because of the force of gravity, not because of some sort of weird innate desire that these non-conscious objects have about things. However, um, one thing I find very interesting is that even though uh, biology as a science um, operates on the model of natural science, you know, uh, operating within the confines of controlled experiments, looking for you know naturalistic descriptions of phenomena in the world, uh, there nevertheless remains an important sense of teleology, and I'll explain really quickly why. Um, one important connection between um, the the purpose or goal of a particular object has to has to do with thinking about what an object is for, in terms of thinking about what its particular function is, right? And so there's a close connection between telos, this Greek word that means goal or purpose, and the idea of, of uh, function. And once we look at uh, biology, specifically, specifically in a very general way, uh, uh, with, with respect to, say, anatomy, we can look at what particular structures are for and define them, describe them, categorize them in terms of what they do, right? So what is the function of the heart? Well, the heart pumps blood, right? It seems to exist for the sake of something. Right? Now again, it's no mistake that Aristotle uh, came up with this, uh, this idea and used it as a way of sort of modeling the entire world because I mean, he started from thinking about living organisms and applied it to the world at large as opposed to apply, thinking about the, the natural world and then seeing how living organisms arise out of it. But further, there's another dimension of, uh, of teleology that's important, um, and that is uh, when consciousness enters into uh, uh, the equation. Right? When we start to think of ourselves as beings that are capable of having goal-directed activity. Right? Now, of course, we can argue about sort of where this occurs uh, uh, in non-human animals. Right? But with human beings, it's clear we act for the sake of achieving particular ends. Right? So I might you know, desire to you know, satisfy myself by eating a sandwich, right? or I might want to you know, do this so that I can um, you know, waste some time, or I might want to do this so I can become smarter, um, and so on. Right? So there are all these kinds of levels of teleological explanations that seem to apply uh, to life. And while on the one hand, science has clearly and appropriately rejected some, um, they, they seem at a different level to be ineliminable in terms of our explanations of phenomena in the world. Right? And this, uh, this distinction between internal and external teleology uh, is a distinction that Hegel makes. Um, it's a distinction that's designed to, um, to explain uh, where to draw this line between sort of uh, uh, acceptable teleology from non-acceptable teleology. So external teleology is teleology with respect to the natural sciences, right? That is, that everything in the you know, world offer, or acts for the sake of some particular purpose, right? So you know, rocks falling down or trying to achieve their natural goal of being at the center of the earth. Whereas internal teleology is uh, of the, the second kind I described, teleology in the, in the context of not some ultimate purpose, right, but a much more a circumscribed one, right? All right, so you get that good so far. All right. 
Now, the second thing, th this quote here, the real is rational, uh, is a, um, another f famous quote of uh, Hegel's. And um, wh wh what it means, it's a, it's a quote that's uh, well reflective of Hegel's own thought, but of also of Aristotle's as well. And the idea is that uh, our way of thinking about the world, the kinds of concepts that uh, we develop, the kinds of concepts that we use to explain and describe the world, um, this quote that the real is the rational indicates that, uh, the, the belief that these concepts do in fact reveal the way that the world actually is. Right? So that as, as we think about how we understand the, the world, what we're doing is not just knowing something about our own thoughts, right? but rather that we are um, discovering something deep about how the universe itself is structured. Right? In other words, the human mind, <coughs> excuse me, the human mind is so constituted as to be able, through its own operations, to reveal the way that the universe actually is. Right? Now, this is, is certainly a controversial claim, um, it, but it's, a, it's certainly a very interesting one. Right? Um, it's a very important one in philosophy to try to figure out whether or not it's possible for us to uh, really be confident that the way that we think about the world does, in fact, tell us how it is. Right. Now, the reason why this is, this is interesting right, is because uh, once we begin to develop these kinds of uh, philosophical conceptions of things, right, if our concepts do, in fact, mirror the way the world is, what we know about the world, well, it, it better be the case that, it, uh, that these concepts, this understanding about things, gels with things that we know about the world. Right? In other words, if I, uh, if I have some you know, a series of conceptions, right, and uh, it turns out that there are you know, a whole boatload of experiments that, uh, you know, that are uh, directly in contradiction with my conceptions about the world, if it's true that the real is rational, then it, you know, it's probably my conceptions that are wrong and not the, uh, not the experiments. Right? Now, what's interesting about this, and again, um, this is, I think, is... Um, uh, very telling with respect to Hegel's philosophy of nature is uh, if you read his book, uh, he's not like, say, some philosophers of science who, um, you know, sort of sit in their, um, you know, their, their ivory towers and just sort of speculate on what might be nice to say about science, um, but rather he was incredibly well-versed in the science of his day, right? And so in the philosophy of nature, for example, he, he discusses in, in succession um, uh, geologic and meteorological phenomena. He discusses uh, plant life as well as animal life. And the kinds of accounts he puts in there reveal his familiarity with the science of his day. Right? I mean, this would be akin to him you know, sitting down on you know, you know, every Sunday afternoon reading science or nature. I mean, he was well aware of the, sort of the current state of things. Um, and so uh, it seems to be a, a uh, an implicit goal of his to make sure that his understanding of science, his understanding of biology, is consistent with what empirical scientists and uh, um, thinkers are uh, currently working with. Right. So that, again, is just a, 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 a sort of a quick uh, introduction to <coughs> part of the problem. So let's look at this uh, oops, a slightly different way. right? Here is uh, a quote from Aristotle in, uh, uh, in the physics, right? And these two quotes here, one from Aristotle and one from John Locke in the essay concerning human understanding, um, can begin to uh, reflect a little bit about, well, the, uh, what it is I'm getting at in terms of thinking about teleology um, as well as uh, uh, understanding the relationship between our rational conception of the world and the way that the world really is. Right? So Aristotle says, he asks himself the following question. Right? Why then should it not be the same with the parts in nature? For example, that our teeth should come up of necessity, the front teeth sharp, fitted for tearing, the molars broad and useful for grinding down the food, since they did not arise for this end, but was merely a coincident result. Such are the arguments which may cause difficulty on this, uh, on this point. Yet this cannot be the true view. Right? Now why does Aristotle think this is not the true view? Well, it has to do with the notion that this is a coincident result. Right? So uh, as you guys might know, um, you know, uh, uh, evolution by natural selection says that those organisms that manage to develop traits that are uh, adaptive for, for them, that enable them to survive, thrive, and whatnot, are um, you know the ones that are selected for, right? Uh, this is a process that 
occurs, well, purely randomly. There's no design to it. Um, it just sort of seems to happen that way. The, the design that we see is uh, sort of you know, us uh, you know, fitting that concept on there. Um, Aristotle didn't believe that anything in nature happened by chance. Right? And so Aristotle rejects this view outright because it conflicts with this idea that things in nature don't happen in vain. Right? Everything happens in a way that is uh, describable right, with respect to a, a number of different sets of uh, criteria. And we don't have to go into that, but uh, um, that constitutes his, uh, his rejection of this. Right? Now, let me discuss this quote from Locke real quick and see how I can make some sense out of this. Right? So Locke uh, was one of the great empiricist philosophers in the, um, uh, the British tradition. Right? The empiricist philosophers held that all knowledge ultimately comes from experience. And any knowledge that doesn't come from experience should be rejected. And Locke's essay concerning human understanding is one of the first major works that tries to develop this empiricist philosophy. Right? Um, but very far on into the essay concerning human understanding, he discusses um, the idea of species. Right? And he says this, general natures are nothing but abstract ideas. And he who thinks that general natures or notions are anything else but such abstract and partial ideas of more complex ones, taken at first from particular existences, will, I fear, be at a loss where to find them. For let anyone reflect and then tell me in what does his idea of man differ from that of Peter or Paul. Right? What he means is that we have a better idea about specific individual people than we do of some general abstract concept like, you know, man or human being, right? For example, and this is an example I give my intro, intro to philosophy students all the time, right? When you think about, uh, you, know, you know, dogs, if I ask you to imagine a dog, right, you usually imagine a particular dog as opposed to coming up with the necessary and sufficient conditions for something to be a dog, right? Now, the reason that this uh, is relevant in the, the context of, say, biology and evolutionary biology is that it's true, and of course the biologists in the, the, the room here can um, correct me if I get this wrong, but my, my understanding of this is that you know, we, we work hard to find a classification of living organisms, right? And there's various different ways of doing this. Um, and we can you know, divide things up by um, sort of you know, genetically uh, in terms of their morphology uh, and, and so on. And to a large degree, these kinds of things you know, work well, right? To, you know, to use you know, genus and species to say that this belongs here and this belongs there, right? But if we stand back for a minute, and look at the entire timeline of, say, biological history, right? We have to recognize that these categories and classifications are uh, mutable, right? So that human beings don't, uh, uh, you know, Homo sapiens, right, is not a category that is fixed in time. It's not some sort of, uh, you know, eternal thing, but is constantly changing. Um, and what makes it a constantly changing thing? Well, it has to do with the constantly changing particulars that go into make up this you know, overall category, right? So what generates for us, uh, uh, I think, a problem in Hegel, right, is his understanding, right, of the empiricist view and his commitment to an, an empiricist scientific view that says that what we know about nature is ultimately something that we know about particular things, right? But nevertheless, there's a, a view in the back of his mind that comes from Aristotle as well as other philosophers that, uh, that says that, well, what is most real, right? What is true about the, the nature of the world is something that is, again, not a matter of chance or some random process, um, but rather something that is ultimately immutable. Right? So uh, there's a conflict, right, between the uh, uh, sort of the, the mental conception of natures as somehow fixed and determinate Right? versus our observations of the world uh, as something that is, uh, well, changing and mutable. Right. So here's some quotes of, of Hegel. Perhaps I should say, before we get uh, much further about this, no, I won't say that. We'll wait and see if it comes up. Right? Here's a quote about... Here's a quote about uh, 
that, that Hegel makes uh, in the philosophy of nature regarding uh, evolution, right? And again, like I said, it's not just that he's uh, um, uncomfortable with it. He seems to flat out reject it, right? Uh, chronological difference has no interest whatever for thought, but it must, must not be imagined that such a dry series is made dynamic or philosophical or more intelligible by representing the terms as producing each other. The land animal did not naturally develop out of the aquatic animal, right? And this right here seems to be a clear relation clear rejection of evolutionary biology, right? Now again, I told you that it's, um, um, uh, it, it would have been impossible for him to have known anything about Darwin. I mean, Hegel died in the, I think, 1831 or 1832. And again, Origin of the Species is 1859, if I recall correctly. But he certainly was aware of Lamarck, right? Um, and uh, uh, this is evidenced not only by, uh, um, well, just you know, the, the, the juxtaposition in time, right, but also Hegel cites other works of Lamarck in his book and discusses Lamarck's ideas. Right? So um, again, he's familiar with Aristotle, he's familiar with Lamarck notwithstanding. He seems clearly to reject the idea that, uh, uh, that there is this, uh, this idea of uh, a natural progression of, of species. So what is it then <coughs> that uh, perhaps leads him to uh, this particular point of view? Well, one way. I think to describe the, um, why he's so willing to reject it is to think about what his philosophy of nature is uh, in particular. Right? Now one of the unfortunate things about philosophy of science is that philosophers of science do something very different than what scientists actually do. Right? Um, scientists you know, do experiments, frame hypotheses, and test these hypotheses. Philosophers of science ask questions about, well, what does it, uh, what does it mean for a hypothesis uh, to be confirmed, right? Uh, what counts as a sufficient amount of evidence, right, for there to be, uh, for us to be justified in believing the results of a, of a, of a scientific claim? It's a much more sort of abstract way of, uh, of looking at the, uh, the process and not um, one that's sort of, you know, dealing with the details, right? And I think this is certainly true of Hegel as well. I think Hegel's philosophy of nature is uh, an attempt to try to find the logical relationships between the concepts that are used in understanding natural science um, uh, independent of uh, what's actually say, happening on the ground. Right? And so in this, uh, in this sense, right, um, Hegel might be justified in rejecting evolution as sort of not really a part of the subject he's dealing with, right? In other words, or scientists, biologists, when they look at evolutionary history, what they're doing is they're looking at the, the whole uh, uh, span of history, right? From the early stages of life up to the later and more developed stages of life and trying to fit all the pieces in there in this kind of chronological order, right? Hegel, in thinking about the logically necessary relationships between concepts that we have is trying to jump away from that and look at it sort of, you know, sort of by itself independently of the, the series of temporal events uh, that we experience on the world, right? And this is what he means when he says chronological difference has no interest whatever for thought. Thought, rational thought, is something that is supposed to be timeless and eternal, right? And not something that's subject to the, uh, the contingencies of, of, of actual life. Right. This, again, uh, sort of reflects his commitment to the Kantian idea that what he's after is not so much, um, it's, uh, it's, it's not so much uh, an empirical exercise, right, but rather trying to understand what the conditions of thought are such that we're capable of formulating these kinds of claims about the natural world at all, right? Um, if you guys um, don't know um, Kant's philosophy, um, and I, I mentioned that Kant was this, uh, sort of uh, relevant and important to, to Hegel, Kant represents in philosophy a, a revolution um, insofar as he's not, in his critique of pure reason, not trying to develop or establish a kind of uh, series of substantive claims about uh, what we can know or what exists or what doesn't exist, but rather he wants to ask, what is it about the human mind that makes it possible for us to ask these kinds of questions at all, right? Uh, or to put this a slightly different way, what are the legitimate boundaries of thought, right? Now, one of the central objections to Kant's overall point of view is Kant assumes a lot about 
the way that human beings actually think. Right? Uh, he assumes that there's a, a kind of um, homogeneity between individuals' conceptions of the world, and um, you know, so much so uh, that he just sort of says, look, this is the way that everyone thinks, and uh, you, you have to believe that. Um, Hegel, I think, was sympathetic to Kant's overall project, but wanted to develop his, uh, uh, his, uh, uh, his philosophy in a way in which there were uh, no presuppositions about the way that human beings are inclined to think or um, are predisposed to think. And so his book, The Science of Logic, as well as the Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences, is an exercise in trying to show how every single uh, concept or category that we use can be logically deduced from uh, the prior ones. Right? And again, this is um, uh, uh, an indication of uh, this idea that chronological difference has uh, no interest uh, whatever for thought. All right, let me just check real quick how I'm doing for time. Okay, fine. We go till what, quarter two? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what do I have here? We've talked about Aristotle, <laughs> Kant. We've talked about some reasons why Hegel seems to be uh, um, uh, against uh, this, uh, this notion of um, evolutionary, evolutionary biology as it's sort of a contingent and empirical thing and not a a conceptual thing, right? Um, I don't think I need to focus on so much these. I'd end up talking sort of too long about them. You see. Yeah, let me, let, me, let me talk about this quote here. This is great. Um, this, this idea, if mechanism and propulsiveness uh, stand opposed to one another, they cannot, for that very reason, be taken as indifferent concepts. Um, this reflects, <coughs> in, uh, in Hegel's mind, the, the conflict, when he, when he says mechanism, what he means is sort of this indifferent Newtonian kind of science right, that operates and acts you know, without purpose. Um, and at the same time, uh, this notion of propulsiveness, this understanding of teleology seems to be uh, slathered on top of this. And he recognizes these both as legitimate categories of thought, legitimate ways of seeing the world. And the question that bothers him, right, whether their truth is not a third concept or whether each one of them is the, or whether one of them is the truth of the other, trying to understand and uh, reconcile uh, which is a more appropriate or more real way to identify the way that the world actually operates. Right. Now, um, we can get some illumination on this particular concept by considering some of the, the next claims uh, from, from Hegel that I've pulled out here. The philosophy of nature for Hegel represents an important stage in uh, sort of a hierarchy of concepts. Right? What we start with is just dumb nature, you know, rocks and um, you know, sand and chemical interactions, things that happen without any real sense of purpose. But once we have a higher level of organization, as I mentioned you know, earlier in the talk, there seems to be a much more realistic sense of purpose or functional organization. Right? The way that uh, Hegel puts this, right? He said that a rational consideration of nature must consider how nature is in its own self this process of becoming spirit, of sublating its otherness, and how the idea is present in each grade or level of nature itself. Estranged from the idea, nature is only the corpse of the understanding. So nature for Hegel is not merely something that is, say, non-human, right? Or something different and separate from humans, um, but rather, what it is, is when we consider things at the level of nature, whether we're talking about geology or even more importantly, biology, right? What it is, is it, it reflects a uh, emergence of a kind of self-conscious awareness, right? Um, this is what Hegel means by saying, uh, sublating its otherness and, uh, uh, and becoming, uh, becoming spirit. And this indicates, I think, uh, that uh, a certain dimension of, well, um, how do I want to put this? A certain dimension of, um, actually, let me strike that and let me just move on. All right, this is a, my brain's not working with this one. All right. 
what Hegel really wants to say is that the, what emerges in, in nature, and in particular um, organic nature, is a, a concept of something that is very uh, discrete. Right? It's not so much that uh, we have uh, indifferent, um, uh, uh, sort of you know, random material things that have no sort of real functional uh, identity, but rather we have something that's uh, sort of much more significant. We have something that we might be uh, uh, understood as a particular individual, right? Much more so than. Um, uh, we see in earlier stages. And let me give you a specific example of what I mean by this. I, I, I think what Hegel is getting at is if, if we, say, do a particular scientific experiment, right? Um, let's just say we talk about ice melting into water, right? Now, if I understand the you know, physics of this correctly, you know, all this has to do is how fast the water molecules are moving, right? So the faster that they move, that is the, the, uh, so the more liquid it becomes, if that makes sense, right? This particular um, uh, kind of reaction, uh, this, not reaction, but this particular sort of uh, phenomenon doesn't depend in any way on us being able to identify, say, okay, it requires this particular molecule and this particular molecule and this particular molecule. In fact, any kinds of water molecules will be sufficient to do this, right? However, what Hegel seems to think about organic nature, right, in terms of things like, you know, plants and animals. What is uh, uh, unique about this is that once an organism is formed, or once an organism comes into being, um, because that being has a kind of um, uh, uniqueness um, uh, for, say, higher beings that are sentient, because they have a sort of an individual point of view, an individual consciousness, this then comes to um, uh, uh, signify that there uh, that, that there's a, a, an element of uh, reality that is not um, capable of being subsumed into anything sort of general right, and abstract. Right? When we talk about, say, you know, a porcupine, right, on, one, on the one hand, yes, we can talk about, say, porcupines in general. Right? But when we think about porcupines as a, a, um, as a particular phenomenon, it is relevant for us to think about them in terms of their being sort of actual existing particular creatures. Right? Now, I think that this is, this is important, right, because it pushes, <coughs> excuse me, it pushes uh, Hegel's view further toward the idea that particularity in terms of understanding the natural world does matter, right? And if, uh, uh, if, if, if that's the case, right, then uh, it, it seems that Hegel's uh, rejection of something like evolutionary biology is something uh, that well, can be modified, right, by you know allowing uh, you know sort of modern biology to uh, sort of hold on to this emphasis on uh, on particularity. Now these these quotes here um, are again just a uh, this one on the top here is again a sort of a, a, an indication of uh, uh, Hegel's understanding of the the rise of uh, nature out of um, uh, the sort of mere different categories of things, and this last one, right? This is a, a quote that I, I think uh, can provide a kind of support for the the claim I just made, right? Uh, nature every, everywhere blurs the essential limits of species in general by intermediate and defective forms, which continually furnish counterexamples to every fixed distinction. Um, what Hegel says in the ellipsis there has to do with well, you know, there are deformed people as well. Um, uh, but again, you know, what he means is that for any particular category of things that we uh, have, um, there are also, there, well, there are always things that, uh, you know, function as, as counterexamples that require us to modify and shape our category in different ways, right? The fixed types, but here, and this I think is uh, sort of the interpretive, or something that generates the interpretive problem, that he then goes on to say that the fixed type rather presupposes the self-subsistence and dignity of determinations stemming uh, from the notion. Right. This is a, an allusion or a, a reference to the idea that the real categories of things are things that are fixed and stable uh, and eternal. So on the one hand, he seems to offer us a way of understanding how we could modernize his sort of organic evolutionary ph philosophy in order to accommodate the, um, you know, the, the modern sense of evolutionary biology. But here, on the second hand, uh, or on the other hand, he 
he provides us still with this resistance to the notion that thinking about categories as mutable really um, misses the mark in terms of understanding the nature of categorical thought uh, in general, right? Uh, again, the fixed type rather presupposes the self-subsistence and dignity of the determination stemming from, from the notion. So, you know, throughout this, you know, this has, you know, you know, for me, I mean, this is the first time I've given this talk to anybody, um, uh, and it represents a uh, sort of a curiosity on my part of trying to sort out um, why it is that Hegel seems to so openly reject uh, an evolutionary philosophy, even though his particular ideas seem to be um, uh, open to it. And although um, you guys were probably coming here expecting to you know, hear some sort of profound conclusions about uh, the way that the world is, uh, what actually turns out to be the case is uh, something that is still you know, nevertheless uh, 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 puzzling, right? that there still seems to be um, in Hegel um, uh, a fundamental tension between his his willingness to accept uh, empirical science, right, uh, and the uh, the ability of his philosophical tools to accept, say, modern views, but also his commitment to a certain way of thinking about human cognition that might ultimately prevent this from being realistic, right? Now, um, I think, given that um, uh, Hegel seems to be so uh, um, concerned about representing the current scientific thought of his day, I think that if Hegel were to write today, uh, he would certainly um, be able to include evolutionary biology, right? Now, what does that say about him as a philosopher that he's just sort of following along behind what everyone knows, trying to find some way of you know, sort of, uh, putting together a, a, a rational uh, system behind it? Um, you know, maybe that uh, sort of uh, invalidates his kind of methodology overall. Um, but uh, uh, that seems to be maybe too weak, or not too weak, but uh, too easy of, um, uh, of a conclusion. Um, and so I, I guess for me, from, you know, at, at this point, it's still somewhat a, uh, of a puzzle to me whether it really is uh, possible to uh, sort of massage out of uh, Hegel's works a legitimate account of the, the mutability of categories about life. Uh, that will enable it to be ultimately consistent with, uh, with evolutionary biology. Right? So I guess I'll sort of uh, leave it at that. Right. Thanks for... Thank you.